begin. Great. So, uh, welcome everybody, and to day three. Is it day three? Um, hopefully, you've had a good workshop so far. Uh, so, my name is Sarab Shah, and um, <clears throat> my my lab is in in Vancouver at the BC Cancer Agency. So, I'm a scientist at the BC Cancer Agency and cross appointed to the Department of Pathology and Lab Medicine at uh, at the University of British Columbia. And I also have a cross appointment to the Computer Science Department at, at UBC as well. And um, my research program really sits at the interface of, uh, let's see, does this work? Sort of. Yeah. My, my research program sits at the interface of, of computational and statistical methods development, um, uh, but really with a, with a view that um, all that activity underpins activities in, in, in cancer genomics and studying tumor biology. <clears throat> so, uh, so we develop um, using state-of-the-art methodology and statistics. Uh, we try to model data sets that um, you, you'll be working with over the, over the course of the week. And um, really, uh, biology has changed to a point where we now have capacity to generate incredible vast amounts of measurements and uh, it's become a quantitative science as a result and I'm sure that's why you're all here and you understand that uh, but often what happens is technology uh, to generate data really comes first and methods to analyze the data come behind that's usually how it works and so uh, so I try to focus on really trying to extract the most out of data sets that are generated from things like next generation sequencing devices to maximize the bio biological output of that data. So there's a huge amount of investment going into actually generating the data. And so uh, to optimize that investment, one has to use um, and develop the appropriate analytical tools to learn the most biological uh, value and gain the most bi biological value out of that data. So over the course of today, we'll be talking about uh, two types of features we can extract from, uh, from interrogating the genomes of cancers, uh, copy number variations and, and single nucleotide variations. And, uh, and so we'll go over some methodological aspects and, uh, and also some conceptual points that I hope you'll take home with you. And then to accompany that work that I'll deliver the lectures, um, Andy, uh, who works with me in the lab, is uh, going to run you through two practical exercises uh, to really get your hands uh, dirty with actually working with the data and predicting features that, um, that I'll be talking about today. Okay, so, so this is the outline for this morning's lecture, um, copy number variations. Um, I think I'll just jump right into it. So we have until, Michelle, we have until what time? For this? Okay, so let's just start out with uh, with this picture. So, um, how many people have seen pictures like this? Yes, no, maybe so. Yes, okay. So this is just a, a, a normal human karyotype, and what this shows is that uh, the DNA in our cells is nicely organized into 23 pairs of chromosomes, 22 autosomes, and a pair of sex chromosomes, um, and so you really inherit um, one copy of uh, your genome from your mother and one copy from your father. Okay, so this is just the, the level playing field from which we all start, and all of our normal cells, with the exception of um, some blood cells uh, in the immune system, essentially look like this. So. I want to take you back to nearly 100 years ago um, to uh, Theodore Bovary, who was uh, an eminent biologist at the time. And so he had a hypothesis while studying um, sea urchins. And he noticed that some of his cells became essentially malignant and had uh, uncontrolled growth properties associated with them. So he says that we start with the assumption that qualities of malignant cells have their <coughs> origin in a defect that exists within them. And the thing about sea urchin cells is that they have very large nuclei. And so he was able to really look at these uh, nuclei with, without um, very high-powered microscopy. And so he noticed that when cells achieve this growth proliferation uh, phenotype, that they had aberrant chromosomes. They had an extra copy of one of the chromosomes. So he, that led him to this um, hypothesis. 
So the, the main point about this is he started to think about um, that the culprit behind human malignancy maybe originated in the genetic material of human cells. And, uh, and of course, he was proven right in 1960 with the discovery of the Philadelphia chromosome in CML by uh, Peter Knoll. And so that was uh, really the first time that uh, human malignancy had been associated with a change in the structure of the genome. So here's just an extreme example then of, um, of one of the most uh, highly disrupted uh, diseases with the, with the most disrupted karyotypes is, is high-grade serous ovarian carcinoma. And, uh, and this is a slide <coughs> given to me by uh, David Huntsman. And so you can see here that instead of this nice organization of the genome where we have two copies, one from maternal and paternal uh, sources, we have some chromosomes with extra copies. Um, this is a really bad pointer. Is there, a, is there another one? Oh, there's another one here. Okay, that's better. Yes, so we have some that have uh, extra copies. Um, we have some chromosomes that are entirely deleted. Um, and then we have uh, chromosomes that are mixed uh, uh, from two different original chromosomes. They've, been, they've come together with translocations. Um, and so, so we're going to focus today on the types of events that uh, yield uh, extra copies of certain events and also parts of the chromosomes that have been deleted. And these are called copy number variations. So these are really losses or gains of genetic material. So you can think of these as they're also known as segmental aneuploidies. And what that means is if you have a uh, you think of the genome as a, as a linear object. Um, there are segments of the genome that uh, either are duplicated or deleted. And, uh, and so this can be, um, we have really uh, several different classes. Um, one is, uh, and, and they, these can be germline um, or they can be somatic. Okay, and so uh, in, when we look at the profile of populations of tumors, um, this is the genomic landscape of breast cancer. And we plot on the, uh, so against the x-axis, it's just a linear ordering of uh, the genome here by chromosome. And the y-axis is the percentage of patients um, that exhibit uh, an abnormality in that particular region of the genome. We can see that um, the majority of the genome has some level of disruption in, at, at some minimum number of uh, patients in the, in the population, dominated by, for example, uh, amplifications of chromosome 1Q, uh, deletions of, of AP, uh, and uh, et cetera. And so, and if you look over here um, in 17, this is the, the classic um, HER2 amplicon right here. Okay, and so you can see that um, this is really just a major feature of this disease is that the genome is highly disrupted. And um, if you were to look at a normal population, um, you might see, uh, uh, you know, very small regions of the genome that have, um, that have variation that basically leads to just humans being different from each other. Um, but these are really uh, a feature of the disease state. So let's just simplify that for a minute, and we can think of a few different types of, um, of events. And so, so let's just say we have uh, a region of the chromosome here, and uh, in this, contained within this region are genes A, B, and C. We could have a deletion where uh, the part of the genome that contains uh, gene B is, uh, becomes um, deleted and is, is no longer there during a cell replication cycle. Uh, we could have a, uh, a replication uh, of just one gene, so, so we could have a localized uh, replication of, of gene A here, or we could have a whole section um, called a segmental duplication that generates um, a, an additional copy of a set of genes that are essentially in tandem. And so the consequence of that, as you can imagine, uh, are that, uh, let me just advance this, is that um, if we have, for example, in a deletion region, uh, if there's a tumor suppressor in that, uh, that region where the role of that gene is to uh, guard against uh, growth and proliferation or uh, execute uh, DNA repair, uh, we can imagine how uh, the loss of that material uh, would result in, a, in no translation of that protein um, and therefore that function is lost in the cell and so that cell can gain a, a new phenotype. 
And then uh, conversely, if you have uh, copies of the material that are, are gain, we have extra copies of a gene whose job it is to promote growth and proliferation, uh, then, uh, then there'll be more copies of that protein around it, and that can trigger a phenotypic change uh, that would result in growth and proliferation. And so, uh, so we really, uh, in cancer, looking for copy number variations um, can lead us to understanding the biology of the disease state and really identify, uh, ultimately, for uh, diagnostics and prognostics targets for, uh, for therapeutics. And, uh, and to really understand the association of biological phenotypes with genetic abnormalities. So CMBs can be broken down into, uh, into three major categories, uh, these congen congenital abnormalities, um, which are uh, usually germline mutations, and the, really the classic um, uh, event that everyone um, really can, can identify with is trisomy 21. So this is three copies of chromosome 21 that leads to Down syndrome uh, and also uh, intellectual disability. So, uh, and then we have uh, somatic alterations, um, and uh, the, this is, these are associated with um, post-germline changes. These are acquired mutations that are tissue-specific, and, and is really a hallmark of most, if not all, cancers. And uh, all cancers exhibit uh, some level of disruption in the genome. Uh, and then we have benign variations, which are, uh, as I said, just polymorphisms that are naturally occurring in the, in the human population. And it really wasn't until uh, about five or six years ago that we really appreciated the level to which um, structural changes exist as a source of variation in the human genome. Um, it wasn't until high-dimensional arrays came on the scene that um, we were able to profile large populations of humans and realize that upwards of, of, of 10 to, to 15 percent of the genome is subject to variation at this level. And, um, and so we have, uh, uh, through, the, through the populations accumulated in the HapMap project, for example, where uh, they, th there's a populations that were ethnically isolated um, populations, we were able to really characterize that there are uh, a significant amount of the genome is subject to, to polymorphism at this level, where it was previously only appreciated that this was happening at single nucleotide polymorphism. That was well known, but the structural variation component was, uh, is relatively new. So then in cancer, uh, which is what we're all interested in, uh, there are several different classes of, of events. So we can have segmental aneuploidies. We usually call these um, large-scale, uh, they're often low copy gains or deletions, and they tend to be broad. And so they can um, span whole chromosome arms, generally speaking, um, or it can be even whole chromosome events as well. So you could have uh, a replication, for example, of um, it's chromosome 17, which harbors p53, is often a, a chromosome that gets entirely deleted and occasionally will then um, duplicate again. So, uh, so that's a feature of, uh, of a lot of the epithelial cancers, is a, a, a whole chromosome loss of 17. Then we can have fo focal copy number alterations, and these are deletions of amplica amplifications um, of, of really high amplitude. So Usually for deletions of this nature, uh, they, they're what we call homozygous deletions, where both maternal and paternal copies are deleted, and they tend to target uh, just one or a few genes. And the reason for that is that there's very little tolerance to, um, to eliminate both copies of the genome um, in terms of evolutionary selection. So the viability of cells that have large chunks of their genome where there are no copies left uh, is relatively small. And so these tend to, to get selected against in cancer progression. But targeting very specific genes um, can result in, uh, in, in homozygous uh, deletions or, or uh, high-level amplifications. And these really can be the very good indicators of driver events. And we'll talk about what driver events are um, later on. And you'll likely, uh, have you talked about rearrangements? You probably did that a little bit about that yesterday. Yes? Yeah, okay. So, so rearrangements are, all, are part and parcel of this mechanism to disrupt the karyotype of the genome. Um, we tend to view them quite simply because it's very linear uh, uh, from a copy number perspective. But many are actually also um, trans translocated. To, so, so there's a result of translocations and shuffling the deck, the genomic deck 
Um, and so this is an important uh, aspect, uh, which we won't really talk about in the context of these two labs, but I think you'll be talking about translocations and gene fusions in other parts of the uh, workshop. Okay, so, so this is really uh, the, the, the quintessential copy number amplification in, in, in cancer. And the reason why it's, uh, uh, it's so important is that um, this is the ERB2 gene, um, which encodes a HER2 protein. And, uh, and so this is uh, chromosome 17 of, of a breast cancer. And you can see there's a very localized amplification uh, shown in red here, uh, where the y-axis is essentially the, the number of copies that are predicted um, to exist at this location. And, um, and each data point here represents a probe on a, on a DNA microarray. This is a high-density genotyping array. We have a probe approximately every 1.5 1, 1 kb in the genome. And so with fairly high, this is a fairly high-resolution array. And, um, and you can see that there's just a very localized event with a, with a massive amplification of this region. And, and contained within this region is, is this HER2 protein, which is, um, which is the growth factor receptor that sits on the cell surface. And, and this is really quite important because um, breast cancers that were characterized with uh, overexpression of, uh, of HER2 um, are typically have a very aggressive disease course and, and up until recently were, uh, had the worst outcomes um, and, and had the, the highest morbidity. And in the late in the 90s, uh, there was a, a, a drug, an antibody that was developed um, against this protein, uh, and essentially now is the post. This is the poster child for targeted therapy in cancer. So uh, patients come in; they all get tested for uh, for HER2, and um, and then patients that exhibit high levels of HER2 will be administered um, a drug called Herceptin, and, and now the five-year survival rate for um, for patients of this. Uh, class uh, is much improved due to due to target therapy. So whenever you talk about you hear about personalized medicine, this is personalized medicine. This is the this is the biggest uh, and most successful example that we have today of, of personalized medicine. There are other examples as well, but um, this is uh, this is one that's in routine practice and probably affects the most people. So let's just look at the effect of these types of events uh, on expression levels. So here what's plotted is the, uh, the magnitude of the copy number uh, of the copy number of a particular gene. And, um, and then on the y-axis is the, uh, the expression level at the mRNA level of that gene in the same patients. And so, uh, so this is uh, from a data set that uh, was published last year from our group. And, um, that, that performed simultaneous measurement of copy number and gene expression on 2,000 breast tumors. Okay. And so what's plotted here is a subset of 1,000 of those tumors. And you can see that um, the, the colored dots here represent uh, deletions in green, uh, neutral regions in blue, and then uh, amplifications uh, in gains and amplifications in, in red and, and orange. And so uh, there's a, a fairly nice correlation. Um, there, this is really two distributions. So you have, here you have the neutral regions that have this kind of variable expression. Uh, and then you start to see a, a very, pretty tight correlation between um, the copy number of that, uh, of a particular, um, of that region and its expression. So this, this is something that we would uh, assume is the, the gene expression of that particular uh, gene is, is, uh, is associated with its copy number. So the copy number in the genome is having some effect uh, downstream on the transcriptional levels of, of that protein. Okay? Uh, and so here's another example here. And, and then this is a different region, uh, 11Q13. Uh, we found some other uh, genes that are highly correlated with, with their copy number state. Okay? So that's a concept that we'll revisit a little bit later as well. So that, those were amplification examples. Um, this is a deletion example. So this is now just a zoomed in um, look at, at P10 on chromosome 10. And so, so here you can see, uh, hopefully you can see this. So uh, each one of these rows uh, is, a, is a patient or a, a specific tumor. And, uh, and then uh, the profile uh, where each dot is, a, is a one of these 1.5 kb regions um, is shown uh, arrayed across the, the chromosome. 
and this is a zoomed in region of, of P10. And, um, and so what's shown here is that you can see in uh, dark green is are what we call one copy or hemizygous deletions. And then the brighter green is an additional copy uh, lost, and these are the homozygous deletions. You can see that the, with the dotted lines here represent the boundaries of P10. And you can see that these homozygous deletions um, target very specifically uh, P10, and sometimes we have subgenic deletions of P10 where only a couple of exons are affected. And so this is a mechanism to inactivate P10 um, that's well known in, in breast cancer, and, and this is just what it looks like when measuring copy number changes at this high resolution. Any questions so far? This, yeah. Okay, so over the last um, several, I would say several decades, uh, the community has accumulated uh, a fairly large body of knowledge that's ever expanding, and um, and this really uh, has resulted in a set of genes that we know uh, across really across cancers are affected by uh, copy number amplifications and deletions. So amplifications uh, I mentioned ERB2, and it, it has a cousin uh, EGFR uh, as part of the same uh, family on chromosome seven. Uh, lung cancers are characterized by uh, amplifications in EGFR and other breast cancers as well. Um, the MYC oncoprotein is uh, well known, uh, PI3 kinase, um, IGF1R, et cetera, uh, and CDK4, CDK6, which is um, part of the RB pathway. So, uh, so these are uh, just a, a few examples that I picked out of well-known genes, um, some of which have, have, uh, are targetable by, um, by selective therapies um, and uh, to be inhibited. And then deletion space, um, set of tumor suppressors such as RB1, P10, um, CDKN2A or P16, uh, MAP2K4, uh, NF1, et cetera. And of course, the, the, the BRCA genes as well. And so um, there have been, in the last, uh, I would say, five or six years, uh, a, a fairly extensive effort to try to profile uh, and discover new genes that are affected by these types of alterations. And, um, uh, and so a lot of these uh, studies have employed high resolution uh, copy number arrays to really interrogate the somatic copy number landscape. And I've just listed a few of the papers here. Uh, there are many others that have uh, been part of this effort. So uh, if you're interested in this, these are, um, these are really kind of population level studies of um, hundreds of tumors to, uh, and cell lines to really characterize the landscape of these, uh, e these events in cancer, and I would encourage you to read these. Okay, so I've talked a little bit about oncogenes, tumor suppressors that are targeted by these events. Um, and then here's just a list of events that we know um, for which there are drugs that are approved and in use um, that can target these events. So, uh, so here's, uh, Here's the um, ERB2 amplicon um, that's, that's listed here, uh, characterized um, mainly associated with breast cancer, um, a subset of ovarian cancers. Um, and trastuzumab is the scientific name for the, the Herceptin drug that I was talking about that's, uh, that selectively targets this, this protein. Um, and so there, there are a class of PI3 kinase inhibitors that, uh, that will um, inhibit amplifications of PI, PI3, uh, PI3 KCA. Okay, so uh, so this is just uh, uh, no. This is just to illustrate that these events um, are important to characterize because, um, as I said, they're specific to tumor cells, and so um, inhibiting uh, inhibiting these these amplifications events should have um, high specificity and and action in in just the tumor cells. Okay, good. Okay, so what I will do now is just um, go through uh, a study that, uh, that was published last year that for which we profiled uh, 2,000 breast tumors and, um, and used the data to stratify the population into molecular subgroups. So let's just look at that landscape. So if you think about the earlier landscape plot I showed, um, it was really, uh, we had uh, broad changes across the, the genome. 
And, uh, and so not all of those events will affect the mRNA expression. Um, so I showed you the classic examples on the scatter plots where we have genes that we were able to isolate that really seem to be highly correlated with expression. Um, and when we overlay just those genes, uh, what you can see is that the landscape gets sharply focused. And so uh, we can really look at these peaks. And this is, again, um, just frequency in the population on the y-axis. And, uh, and then the genes are just ordered according to how they appear in the genome on the x-axis here. And so, uh, so this amplicon here is, uh, is AP12, and this is well known, it has uh, uh, FGFR1. And, and in fact, um, what our work uh, led to was uh, the discovery and characterization of ZNS, ZNF703, which um, we've shown now, if you overexpress this, um, will, uh, will definitely lead to malignant properties. And so uh, this is a new driver, uh, driver gene in cancer. Um, here we have uh, a region uh, on 11Q13 that's characterized by uh, CCND1 and also a second, I don't know if you can see the two peaks, but um, so this, this amplicon here uh, has tradi had traditionally been viewed as a single event. So uh, it's, it's, it's fairly, it was fairly broad um, because low resolution technology couldn't resolve, in fact, the fact that it's actually two separate events that are, that are mutually exclusive. And they contain different genes and actually um, cluster patients uh, differently. And so, so this led to the identification of a new subgroup of breast cancer that's about 4.5% of the population. And, uh, and so, uh, and, and this is a really, I'll show you in the next slide, how that uh, impacts outcome. And then, so that's the amplification landscaping. And, and then on the deletion side, we were able to identify genes like PPP2R2A. Now this, this takes place in the context of a very broad uh, deletion of the, of the 8P arm. And so, the, like I said earlier, deletion of 8P is a major feature of breast cancer. Um, it can be upwards between 30 and 50 percent. And so identifying a gene that might be um, targeted by that event is really quite difficult because it's literally thousands of candidates. Um, but what we're able to show is that when you overlay expression, um, the gene that was most affected uh, is this PPP2R2A um, uh, gene, and, and Melissa knows a lot about this pathway, so you can ask her about that. Uh, I'll put you on the spot there. Um, and so, and then also uh, we identified um, uh, what I would call uh, a backseat driver. So, so what this means is that this is the locus of CDKN2A. Uh, CDKN2B, and this is a this is a known tumor suppressor, um, also known as P16. And what we notice is that M, this gene MTAP, which is a metabolic gene involved involved in purine biosynthesis, is almost always co-deleted. And so, uh, so the implications for that um, are not yet known. But um, this 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 one comes along for the ride. But its expression and downstream expression. Uh, of, of related genes in the pathway are also affected. And so, although the, the conventional wisdom thinks that, says that CDKN2A is the target, um, there's collateral damage here with, with MTAP, and, and that suggests that maybe uh, uh, selection is operating on, on the co-deletion of those two genes. Okay, and then uh, MAP2K4 uh, is a relatively uh, newly identified uh, tumor suppressor it's now pop, popping up in lots of different epithelial malignancies. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a new um, breast cancer gene, essentially, that uh, is shown across the subtypes. It's shown in different um, cancers as well. And, uh, and so this was uh, amongst the first studies to really identify and hone it on, on MAP2K4. Okay, so, so this is the, the global view of the whole population. Of course, what I mentioned at the beginning is what we wanted to do is um, uh, breast cancer had typically been classified uh, in the late 90s. It was discovered that there were five reproducible ex gene expression subtypes and uh, that um, you probably know in the, in the doctrine today. And, um, but what we notice is that even within those subtypes, there's heterogeneous, uh, heterogeneous response to therapy uh, and, and it's not always uh, predictive. And so uh, we tried to take this high resolution data set with copy number and gene expression lots of patients with clinical outcome data and, um, and really try to substratify this, this population. So we take these measurements of copy number and gene expression together. We found that the data 
uh, segregated quite nicely into about about ten different subgroups, and um, and and so they're they're characterized here. I'm just showing um, in in the discovery set of we basically split the data into uh, half discovery and half validation, um, and uh, these were the reproducible groups that um, that are characterized here. And so so here's the uh, the HER2 group here. So this is um, and what's shown here is basically the specificity of the profile um, across uh, across the whole genome. And so when you see um, uh, black dots that are um, high on this axis, that means that that's very specific to that group. And so here's the HER2 group, and you can see it's characterized by this very uh, focal amplification on chromosome 17. Um, this is the uh, 11Q13 uh, group that I was talking about uh, that has this, is characterized by the, um, the amplifications in uh, CCND1. Uh, and, and then we have, uh, for example, uh, this profile here, where is number 10? This profile here is, is classically associated with um, the basal subtype, um, if you know uh, about the, the gene expression subtypes in breast cancer. And this is, um, this is the, the set of, of tumors uh, that really has the worst prognosis and the most aggressive disease. So then when we uh, overlay the clinical data, and you've seen curves like this um, yesterday, hopefully. Did Anna actually talk about this paper? Or? Or, no. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. So, so then, um, what we what we then did is is we took these groups that we were able to reproduce from just from a from a clustering perspective, and uh, and then we um, then we actually ran the the survival curves that um, we learned how to do yesterday, uh, and this was really a unique resource because we had um, more than ten years follow up on most of these patients, and uh, and so it was an international effort to accumulate a resource that large. And so um, we had fresh frozen tissue, um, and uh, we're able to do uh, nucleic acid extraction for the DNA and RNA, uh, as well as have the outcome data to um, to to see how um, how prognostic the stratification of the groups actually were. And so I mentioned to you that um, uh, the the worst group. Um, so a lot of these patients were prior to Herceptin, so they, these were acquired um, before the Herceptin era. And so uh, the, the group with the worst prognosis here is, this, uh, is the HER2 group. Okay. So you can see here that um, uh, this group has the worst survival, and, and if you were to plot this today, um, I think the curve looks something like, like this. So there's been a really dramatic improvement um, in, in the uh, trajectory of, of these patients. And then um, the thing to remark here is that um, it's is really this group here, uh, and and this was um, this was a surprise to us. This is a group that is um, uh, would have originally been classed as luminal bees, which has a, uh, a fairly the ER positive tumors, which have are generally characterized in the populations having fairly favorable prognosis. Um, however, uh, this subset of these patients. Um, when taken out to, uh, to 150 months, for example, um, have uh, a median survival rate of, um, uh, of less than 0.4. And so, uh, so this, is a, uh, this is a novel group that has a, a pretty severe um, prognosis uh, that really splits this um, one, of the, one of the five subgroups, the luminal B subgroups, into this 11Q13 containing and then, and then the rest. Okay, so, so looking at the going back to the importance of copy number alterations, so we likely would not have found these groups had we not looked at the genome. So a lot of the molecular subclassification of breast cancers uh, had been uh, focused on the transcriptome, so gene expression profiling using um, microarrays, uh, and, and there's been a rich literature since, um, since the mid-90s that profiled different diseases according to expression profiles. Um, but a higher uh, resolution and a, and a much better stratification can be achieved when looking at the genome and transcriptome um, simultaneously. And, uh, and so, so there, there, that's the importance of, of looking at the, the copy number space. So then, um, in addition to what we call uh, cis effects, so where the gene of interest is affected by copy number changes, um, and then we look at the expression pattern of that same gene, 
Uh, we can also look at the expression patterns of, of other genes as well. So if there is, is there an association with uh, affected expression at other loci in the genome? And so you can imagine, for example, if uh, you have an amplification of, uh, of, of a transcription factor uh, whose job it is to drive a, a, a set of genes, um, then that might have a cascading effect across the, the whole landscape of, of that transcriptome. And, uh, and so what we plotted then was um, the, the correlation of the copy number on the x-axis and, um, and, 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 and the gene expression on the y-axis. You can see that there are regions of the genome that really have uh, uh, a dramatic effect. Um, so here, uh, a red dot in this matrix represents a positive correlation, a green dot represents a, a negative correlation. And so where you see, um, sorry, it's the other way around, green dot represents a positive correlation. So you'd expect on the, the diagonal that um, a large number of genes will be uh, correlated with um, gene expression in cis. Uh, but the in trans, where you see effect across um, different spaces, um, will show up as vertical stripes in this in this in this um, diagram. And so, when we look at um, some of these regions, uh, we can then look at the pathways of these genes, and they turn out to be classic um, tumorigenic pathways like cell cycle uh, and and uh, regulation of DNA replication, etc. And so, uh, so what this reveals is that um, not only does do the copy number uh, affect the gene that it's targeting, but it has a downstream effect on, on entire pathways. And, uh, and so this is an important concept to really pull out the, the full biology of, of, of these events when taking these high dimensional measurements. Okay, any questions on this? This may be a fairly new concept. So. Okay, so up until this point, uh, we've been talking about um, the copy number as a whole. So where we take um, to what we call total copy number, which is the sum of the maternal and paternal alleles uh, in the genome. But of course, uh, we know that um, these copy number changes um, can be allele specific. And so, uh, so let's just talk a little bit about what that means from a pers perspective of genotype. So uh, in a normal heterozygous state, um, you would have, again, a, a, a maternal and paternal copy or uh, a major or minor allele, and, um, and that would be characterized by, um, by AB. And, um, and so this is just classic nomenclature where we have um, one letter here, the A represents um, the maternal and, and B represents the paternal for sake of argument. Um, and so you can be uh, at each locus in the genome that you're looking at, um, you can be homozygous for, uh, for the, the A allele, it can be homozygous for the B allele, or, or one can be a heterozygous. Um, and so that's with copy number two. And when you move to copy number three, the genotype state space um, increases. So one can imagine that, um, that there's an allele, starting with the AB state, um, there's an allele-specific uh, amplification of the A allele and that would result in a genotype of AAB, okay? Or uh, one can imagine that there's a gain of the B allele, in which case the genotype would be ABB. Yeah. Is everyone following that? Okay, good. Okay, and then we can have um, loss of heterozygosity. Um, so, so if we were starting with the, uh, with the AB state, um, then you can imagine that there's a loss of A, and then uh, with three copies, you'd have to have two extra copies of B. And that would result in, um, in, a, in a BBB uh, genotype. And so, uh, and that just continues um, uh, basically as we go up uh, in copy number. And so typically what we do is we try to class these events into uh, zygosity status. Um, one can be heterozygous, diploid at a region. Um, you can have a, a deletion-induced loss of heterozygosity. Um, or copy neutral, which is two copies of loss of heterozygosity. Uh, and then um, as we go up, um, we have these different classes. And, and, and when we get into copy number four or greater, you can have what we call allele-specific copy number alteration. So, so here you have um, uh, just the A allele is, is, is amplified many times, but the B allele is still intact. So this has some different consequences. Um, one can imagine that uh, the 
as long as the B allele is still expressed, that biology is still there. Um, and, uh, and so this is still classed as heterozygous. Um, and the biology might change significantly if, if you had extra copies, but the B allele is actually gone. So this would be amplified LOH. So how does that look like um, in, in the data sets that, that we're, we're interested in? So here what's shown is, uh, is a, a figure from um, a paper we published in Genome Research last year. Um, and this is, uh, this is actually sequence data. And we'll get into how to, how to process this. But um, <coughs> what's shown here is the, is the normal DNA for this particular individual. And um, what's profiled is every, every polymorphism in that person's genome. So every heterozygous polymorphism in that person's genome. That's profiled just by, um, by sequencing that person's normal DNA and identifying the polymorphisms. And what you'd expect is that 50% uh, of the reads might suggest um, uh, the wild type allele or the A allele, and 50% of the reads might represent the, the variant allele. And so the average uh, allelic ratio is centered around 0.5. So these are all the lo loci in this person's genome, or uh, just on this particular chromosome, that are heterozygous polymorphisms. Okay, makes sense? And then what we can see is that in the tumor, at those exact same positions, we profile the tumor and we, we look for uh, the allelic ratio of those positions. And you can see that, that this centering around 0.5 in certain regions is, is totally gone. So here's an example of a region that um, would have will class as, as, being, uh, as having loss of heterozygosity. And, uh, and so there are some explanations when you look at the total copy number. So let's just focus in on this region here, okay? So here's a, a region where you have this deviation away from 0.5. And you look in the copy number and see, and lo and behold, there's a accompanying deletion there. Um, so this is a one copy loss of uh, one of the, the, either maternal or paternal chromosome. And, um, and you can see that has a, an effect on the the heterozygosity of the polymorphisms in that region. Okay, all right. So this is a sim this this can really be viewed as um, this is like the symptom of, of this event here. So why is this important? Is that so? Here's a region. So if we just to look at the um, the copy number, you would look at this region and say, aha, okay, well it's just neutral, it's unaffected, it's got um, the same number of copies as in normal. Uh, and, and here it's just classed as blue, and this is a neutral region. So this has, this has two copies by our prediction from total copy. But then when we look at the alleles in that region, you can see that there's also this, this split away from, um, from heterozygosity. So, so what could have happened here? Any, any ideas? Right, right, exactly. So, so there are a number of terms for this, unique parental disomy, um, copy neutral, LOH, um, but it's exactly that. So it, it really, one requires two events uh, for, this to, for this pattern to occur. Uh, there has to have been a, a, a deletion of at least one allele to make it homozygous, and then, uh, and then that remaining allele has been duplicated again. And so uh, this is copy neutral LOH. And really you can only see this by looking at the total copy number and the allele-specific copy number um, simultaneously. And that's essentially what this tool um, called Apollo, which we published in, uh, in this paper, um, tries to profile. So there's a third region. Yeah? Can I just ask, what would be the selection pressure that caused such an effect? Yeah, so we'll, uh, that's coming in the next slide. <laughs> Good question. Um, so the third region I want to just talk about here is, is this one here. So, so this is also uh, has a signal that is not like this signal. It's not centered around 0.5. Uh, but it's not quite homozygous either in terms of um, its spread. And, uh, and so the, the, the explanation here is that if you look at the copy number, there's an amplification there. And, um, and what's likely happening there is that this is an allele-specific amplification where um, both alleles are still intact, and so you don't have this kind of extreme um, uh, profile where, where the data are centered on the extremes. Um, 
but but there's definitely skewing away, and so this is uh, this is a symptom of an allele specific amplification. Does everyone see that? So this would be something of the AAAB variety or ABBB. All right. So so why do we need to be concerned about uh, modeling alleles in cancer? Uh, and this gets to, to Andy's question here. So if we think about the um, this concept of um, haploinsufficiency. Um, so this is really rooted in the idea of um, uh, from Knudsen's two-hit hypothesis in the I want to say 50s, but I think it's 50s. Um, is that right? Yeah. So um, so so where um, he established that in uh, in our, our in in retinoblastoma by studying um, these very rare families that there is a susceptibility to, um, to acquiring ret retinoblastoma that could be isolated to uh, a, a genetic abnormality in, in RB and, and then a second hit which would render that gene homozygously inactivated uh, would, would eventually lead to cancer. So, so we have one hit it leads to cancer susceptibility and then the second hit would actually um, lead to the full-blown phenotype. So then there are other genes um, where it's enough to just inactivate one copy. Okay, so if we go back to, to this region, this would be an example where um, you have a, a deletion, but we know that there's probably one, just by the copy number um, levels here, there's one copy of the, of the gene is actually still intact. Okay, but um, there are classes of genes that uh, we call haploinsufficiency genes, and, and p53 is one of them, um, where the loss of just one chromosome is sufficient, or the loss of one copy is sufficient to, to induce the malignant phenotype. And so this is what selection is operating on here, is the loss of that one copy. And then, and then so you can imagine that um, uh, if the other copy is, is also deleted, then the severity of the disease even goes up further. So there's a, an aggregate effect of, of losing two alleles, uh, but the, it's sufficient to just lose one allele for that, um, that class of, of molecule. A and then uh, in this paper, they introduce this, this notion of, of quasi-sufficiency, um, where uh, just a, a reduction, a small reduction in expression level starts to induce the malignant phenotype and selection can operate on that. However, um, if all of the, the, um, the protein is lost, then, uh, then we don't have uh, any, uh, then we don't, the phenotype is, 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 is restored again. So, so this is what's called obligate haploinsufficiency. So there must be um, at least some of, uh, uh, of the wild type um, present for that to work. And that P10 is an example of that. Okay, so so by the only way we can really get at this is by looking at the uh, the alleles um, to really understand the nature of what's um, what alleles are still present in the tumor. And uh, and so so doing this copy number analysis um, it can help us do that. And and looking at the actual alleles in the context of heterozygosity um, can start to get at these, these different classes of, of molecule that are, um, that are selected for in different ways. Okay, so 10.30? Okay, I think we're in decent shape. So maybe this is a good place to pause and um, take some questions if you have any. Okay. So what I want to do for the rest of this uh, session is to really go over um, some of the measurement technologies for how do we profile these, these events in cancer. And, um, and, and they really range from very low resolution uh, up to the highest level of resolution. And, and so, um, so fluorescence in situ hybridization, for example, um, is, a, is a way to look at uh, a very small number of, of loci. Uh, where um, one can actually uh, uh, design probes, and they're usually uh, back probes, that uh, can be um, illuminated inside the nucleus of, of cells, of individual cells. And so these are fluorescently labeled probes that um, uh, can uh, 
hybridized to the actual part of the genome that you're probing, and, and then one can actually, through just counting the, the, the dots as they light up under, un, under the different fluorophores, um, one can then just um, count to see whether there's an amplification or deletion of that region of interest. So here you can see, um, so the red probe, um, uh, let's just look at this cell here. So the control probe is green and the, the experimental probe is red here. And, and you can see there are four copies in this cell of that particular locus relative to two copies of the green. And so, uh, so then the, the inference here is that this is an, uh, an amplification of that particular region. And so uh, this is very nice technology, but it's uh, very low throughput. It's very uh, labor intensive. Um, one of the big advantages of this, though, is that one can actually look at um, individual cells and, uh, and, and gain some measure of the heterogeneity that exists within a tumor um, at the single cell level. So um, this is classic cytogenetics that um, is, is low throughput, low, old technology, but it has a, a really, really important um, advantage in the sense that we can look for specific targets and see how um, the, the population the, the population of cells, um, what the distribution of that event in, that, in a population of cells actually looks like. So one can identify different clonal populations by this technology and we'll talk about that in the next um, session. Uh, so then uh, Array CGH uh, started coming on the scene um, uh, in, a, in the um, I'd say late 90s and early 2000s with microarray technology and, and so where um, we could put, uh, for example, an array in parallel um, between 30,000 and 100,000 probes um, across the genome. And really this was not possible without the, the human genome um, scaffold already in hand. And so as the end of the human genome project was, was completing, these types of technologies started emerging where we could, um, where we could localize regions of the genome, we know where they fit, um, and then array these onto, um, onto uh, array technology and start to profile the genome um, across uh, many different loci in parallel. So the, the, the shift from this to this is a giant leap here. Um, this is really, um, this is labor intensive to the point where, um, you know, it's not really practical <coughs> to, to do much more than, let's say, 10 loci. But now, now with, uh, array, with array technology that, that, that gains with orders of magnitude. And then uh, in the early 2000s, uh, towards the mid-2000s, uh, we started to see emergence of much higher density arrays. And this is really driven by this idea that um, one can profile the, the SNPs in the genome uh, to gain some notion of, uh, of gen human genetic variation, and, and that's what really drove this process, was to take um, individual polymorphisms and design oligos around those polymorphisms, and they tended to be about 25 base pairs, um, and try to profile as many common SNPs in the, in the human genome um, as possible. And so, uh, so the vendors like uh, Agilent and, and Lumina started making these arrays that could really profile up to 1,000 or uh, 100,000 to a million SNPs at once. And, and the advantage of this for cancer, um, so really th this is very much driven by the idea that uh, we could look at polymorphisms in the, uh, in the genome to study human variation, also associate germline genetic variation with disease. So um, you've probably heard of GWAS studies. Uh, and so this drove a huge amount of technology development. But um, in the cancer community, what's very nice about this hybridization technology, of course, is that um, uh, the, the quantity of DNA is reflected in these arrays. And so we could start to leverage these genotype arrays to study cancer. Uh, and so that's, uh, that was really quite, quite nice. And then so cancer became quite a big application that um, maybe people hadn't thought of originally uh, when designing these arrays, but um, became very popular uh, use uh, to profile tumors um, in, in a similar way to what I showed with the, uh, the big breast cancer study. And then these days uh, uh, now, um, by the way, I should just some idea of cost. So, so to do these genotype arrays is somewhere between, let's say, five to eight hundred dollars uh, a run uh, per sample, um, and uh, and then now we're achieving uh, full genomes uh, at the nucleotide resolution, uh, where we have uh, literally the three billion base pairs that we can profile. 
And, uh, but of course, the cost of this is, is to do a tumor normal pair um, is still around ten to $12,000. So, so you can, it's orders of magnitude more uh, to look at uh, the whole genome at, at a 30x to 50x coverage. Um, than it is uh, to, to profile a genome with an array. So, so if you have a large population of tumors that one wants to study for copy number changes, um, uh, you know, this is, the genotype arrays are probably still much more cost effective than um, to do the genome um, because uh, it's just uh, it's still prohibit prohibitively expensive. But of course, the advantage of this is that we have um, nucleotide level uh, resolution of the breakpoints. Uh, some of which you may have covered yesterday. Okay, so let's just think about how this works schematically. Okay, so we have a probe that um, we've arrayed on a on a glass slide, and um, and the the fluorescence intensity uh, of the hybridization um, is can be measured uh, just with uh, the ex laser excitation and measurement of that um, that that intensity. And we go through some image processing step, and uh, and then we can take these signals that um, we know where each one of these probes should array onto the the genome or the chromosome, and so we can plot the intensity as uh, as a function of of where the where these probes sit on the genome, and uh, and then start to to measure essentially uh, what is the quantity of DNA at that particular locus, and so again uh, just the more DNA at a particular locus, the higher the, the hybridization intensity signal, um, and the, the, le the less amount of DNA at a particular locus, the lower the intensity signal. And so, uh, and so we can really measure the amount of DNA that exists at each one of these uh, loci in parallel, such that we get something that looks like this. Okay? Um, and then if we zoom in, uh, so here's an example of, uh, of a segmental deletion. Um, just localized in this little area here, um, and, uh, and this is what it looks like when, when, when zoomed in. And so each one of these dots, again, represents the hybridization intensity of, of the tumor relative to normal, and, uh, and then we have, um, here's our deletion that's pretty clear. <coughs> this region of the genome has been, um, it's gone. I'm not having very good luck with laser pointers today, but maybe I'll use my mouse instead. Okay. Um, so, so then uh, the, 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 the way that we actually quantify this is by, uh, through ratiometric measurements, and we just basically take the, um, the, the copy number or the intensity of, uh, of, of the of clone T, a particular chromosome, and, and divide it by um, either a match normal reference that, that we've hybridized as well. So we can take the ratio of the, the actual match normal DNA from the patient of interest, um, or we can um, think about a pooled reference uh, where we might expect that um, the, 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 the average copy number across the human genome is two, and so it just assume um, that you have copy number two. So the, the match normal uh, paradigm is uh, becomes a, you know, very much essential uh, for uh, whole exome or whole genome uh, interrogation. Um, typically, for arrays, it hasn't been um, necessary uh, to the point where um, the the somatic changes are um, can be deconvolved from the germline changes, um, but that's much harder to do uh, for sequencing. So, okay, so that's that was uh, in array CGH, and so then we move to high density genotyping arrays, and um, the measurement is usually at. Uh, uh, about a million loci or more, um, and uh, and again the major and minor alleles are, are measured separately, and uh, and this really offers a key distinction between array CGH, which just measures total copy number, and that's because then we can start to look at uh, regions of loss of heterozygosity, as I showed you um, before. So uh, so I've covered this already um, in terms of how these uh, these technologies gained prominence was really through GWAS uh, genome-wide association studies um, for associating inherited SNPs with human disease. 
Um, and, uh, and it became a nice application to cancer um, to, to profile segmental aneuploidies and, and the other types of events that I've covered this morning. So let's just talk a little bit about um, some of the challenges of statistical inference um, in cancer samples. And I, I don't know if you've covered any of the, this material already. Um, have, you, have you done this like in terms of um, material processing and, and, and normal contamination, that type of, you, you have time? Okay. okay, okay, okay. Okay, good, all right. So, um, so basically, in in tumor cells or tumor tissue, uh, of course, through uh, through increased vasculature and and through lymphocyte infiltration and through stromal um, integration, uh, you have a number of cells in the sample that are probably not malignant. Okay, and that that can be quite severe in in epithelial cancers to the point where m most of the cells, in fact, won't be malignant, uh, or in in diseases like Hodgkin lymphoma where um, the, the malignant cells are, are one in a hundred. And so, uh, so when, when taking a, a biopsy, one has to be very aware that one is not just studying tumor cells um, or profiling tumor cells or measuring tumor cells. So the other aspect is even within the tumor cells, so once, let's say one can assume that you can isolate all the normal um, cells away, we're left with populations of tumor cells um, that, that are different, and they vary. Uh, and, and, and we'll talk a little bit uh, about that uh, in the next section. Um, and, and so one has to be very aware that uh, when studying uh, epithelial cancers in particular, and, and, but also liquid biopsies as well, that uh, there will be clonal populations of cells with different genomes. Okay, so what you're actually profiling is a mixture of populations. So the signal that comes out is an aggregated mixture from different cells. And, uh, and most experimental designs really consist of a single sample from a tumor, and so that, that can have some, some drawbacks. Uh, so then um, the other really important concept is that we want to be able to distinguish Somatic aberrations that exist that are only in the cancer cells, um, thank you, uh, from aberrations that, um, that, that may exist in our germline DNA. Uh, this is a really, really important concept um, to understand uh, the nature of a somatic genetics in cancer and how um, uh, for sporadic disease, not hereditary disease, these are the um, types of... Uh, changes that we want to be able to profile. And then uh, finally, we have this notion of a ploidy. And so um, what that means is a ploidy is essentially a measure of the number of copies of the genome. And on often, tumor cells will uh, acquire um, triploid or tetraploid genomes, as I showed in the, in the very early slides, where we had m multiple copies of the genome that's been replicated. And this can be through um, whole genome endoreduplication, where uh, during mitosis, there's a, a, an event that doesn't allow for, um, for proper segregation of the chromosomes. And so we end up with nuclei with, um, with extra copies of the genome um, across the whole genome. And in fact, it can also happen the other way around, where um, there are examples of cell lines that have been cultured that are haploid, so where an entire copy of the genome uh, is wiped out, and somehow these cells are viable, and, um, and so the malignant cells are actually completely homozygous um, with one copy. And so um, there's an example of um, um, some CLL uh, uh, lymphocytic leukemia cell lines that are really... Um, wonderful <laughs> tools for, um, for looking at uh, genetic manipulation because one only has to induce um, the mutation and, and that will have um, uh, uh, it's a homozygous effect. And so, so there are um, uh, ploidy influences that will, will yield different allele-specific signals. And so the concept here that I just want to stress is that as the assumption in most statistical software packages ignore at least one and often most of these issues, okay? And, and a lot of the times, um, we'll have uh, tools out there that um, 
are really designed for normal human genetics uh, and studying blood cells, for example, from healthy individuals. And, um, and so these are often repurposed for the cancer, for the cancer um, domain, and uh, that will fail to account for all of these different properties that we know exist in the measurements that we're taking. And so hopefully what we'll illustrate um, over the next day um, is that we can account for some of this into uh, statistical modeling. So the point is, is that when studying cancer, uh, really specialized analytical tools are needed. And one should not adopt the practice of just repurposing a tool that's designed for normal human genetics into the cancer domain. So there's a very nice uh, review of these statistical considerations in, uh, in this paper here. I would encourage you to read it. Um, it comes out of uh, Terry Speed's group, and, um, and it's, it's about the, the particular properties of cancer cells um, and how, the, how they are manifested in, in high-density uh, genotyping arrays. So let's now look at the workflow for high-density genotyping array analysis. Um, this is just, uh, this is with respect to Affymetrix SNP 6.0 arrays. And this has really been a, a dominant um, platform, I would say, um, that, uh, that has been in use for the last, uh, let's say, five to, five to seven years now, I think. And um, this has been the platform of choice for uh, a number of the studies that I, uh, I put up earlier in the, um, in the slide deck. So, so the first uh, file that comes off the, the machine is called a cell file. How many people have worked with cell files before? Maybe with gene expression microarrays. Okay, a few of you. Um, the, there's some level of pre-processing and normalization that's required in these, uh, in these workflows. And, uh, and so I'll just walk you through um, some of the tools that can be used. And then we really go through uh, two, parallel, uh, two parallel tracks where we have um, total copy number extraction and, uh, and allele extraction. And uh, so I mentioned those, what those two things are and, and we'll go into a little bit of detail. And then what we do is we do a process called segmentation. And we want to um, separate the genome into discrete segments that exhibit um, different copy number levels. And I'll uh, explain how to do that. And then finally, we can take this and do a gene and pathway analysis in clinical correlations. Okay. So I'm going to make a radical proposal here and suggest a, um, a quick bio break. <laughs> can we do that? Five minutes? Is that all right, people? Okay. And then we'll get into some of the nitty gritty of, um, of SNP6 analysis. So, so five minutes? Yeah, is that okay? All right. Good. We can resume now. So, any questions so far? It's, it's rather quiet, so. You're very clear. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, well. uh, oh, the, the, the macro. <laughs> macro. Is it Illumina is the other dominant platform right? for this sort of thing? It's, yes, that's right. So how different would this work? Yeah, that's that's a good question. So so I think there are. Um, yeah. So the the question is is uh, the other vendor that uh, is in the business of making these high density genotyping arrays is Illumina, and. Um, Generally speaking, uh, <laughs> tools that tend to get developed on one platform. Basically, that's the, that's the short answer. And, um, and, and there's some theoretical translation over to a different platform, but it doesn't always work out. And, and so uh, it, I think the, the only way to really um, to assess that is to do head-to-head -head comparisons, and that often doesn't happen. So um, people typically the developers of methods typically work on the platform that they're interested in or the data, the data that they have at hand. And there are very few methods, I think, that um, with respect to, at least for high-density genotyping arrays, that can translate very well um, and generalize across different platforms. So it's just something to be quite aware of, which is a good point. 
Is that a question? So, so for um, especially at nucleotide level analysis uh, for sequencing data, uh, that's basically a flawed process, and and the reason is is because it ignores the fact that the two data sets are highly correlated with each other. They're from the same actually genetic background. The somatic changes may represent one in a thousand changes that you might one might see across the whole genome. And, uh, and so 90, 999 out of 1,000 events will actually be shared between the tumor and the normal. And so, uh, so one can leverage that, and, and we'll work on that in, later this afternoon. And, and Andy will explain how to do that in, in, uh, in real, with real data analysis. And so one of his, Andy's papers is to, to actually has, has, has um, shown very nicely that when you jointly analyze the two data sets, that the result is, uh, is much more accurate. Okay. Okay, so let's just look at the, the structure of, of apometric SNP6 arrays. Um, we have 25 mer oligonucleotide probes. Uh, this is the, um, these are highly optimized to look at, uh, these are unique regions of the genome, unique 25 mers, and uh, there are approximately 900,000 uh, SNP probes where both the major and minor allele are, are probed. So, so this would be a 25 mer that differ at just the one locus, um, the one nucleotide that's in the middle of that 25 mer. And then um, also part of this platform are 900,000 CNB probes, which don't have a polymorphic uh, locus. They're just for the purposes of copy number variation. And they work on the notion of hybridization intensities, uh, where, again, the more DNA uh, present at that locus, then the higher the intensity of the signal. And, uh, and then there's a, a, a chip definition file, which has all the, the, the gory details of this design um, at this URL to here. And I apologize if this is out of date, but I think this is still, this is still valid. I, I didn't look at that um, since last year, that actual URL. But, um, but you'll be able to find the chip definition file. So going back to the workflow, the first step is pre-processing. And um, there is quite a bit of normalization required to remove the platform-induced artifacts. And the method of choice that, um, that I've really come to, to like is uh, this aroma.affmetrics package. Um, again, out of uh, Terry Speed's group. Uh, here's the URL here. And generally speaking, it outperforms commercial software. It's transparent. It's open source. Um, one knows what, we're, what you're getting, uh, and it's by uh, probably the the world's leading group in um, statistical analysis and microarrays. So, um, uh, so the, the, I trust this package um, pretty wholeheartedly. Um, it's not without its faults, but it's probably the best package out there. And what this outputs uh, is allele specific and total copy number uh, real value data. Uh, so let's just we can go through the, the different steps. So one of the flaws or one of the uh, unintended consequences of this design is that we have um, allele crosstalk. And what that means is that the probe for the major allele uh, may mishybridize DNA from the minor allele and vice versa. So remember that these, these probes only differ at one nucleotide. And so there can be, uh, they, can, they can capture the DNA from the unintended major or minor allele. 
And, and so what that looks like is um, if you were to plot the, um, the B allele against the, 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 sorry, the, the minor allele against the major allele, one should actually see, uh, sorry, it's very difficult to see on this plot, but you should really see three, three groups. You should see um, the homozygous data, data points should, should line up against the y-axis here the, um, for, for the B allele and the, the homozygous for, the, uh, for the, the, the major allele should line up on the x-axis. And then there should be a, a, a cluster that's um, in the middle. And you can see how theoretically, Really, the, these are data clouds, uh, and, and really the clouds represent the level of noise in the system. Okay, so these are not um, discrete measurements uh, that that one would get very accurate um, and completely faithful results. There, and and the the point about allele crosstalk is that one does not get these flat lines uh, across the axis that uh, one would expect theoretically, and so. The uh, aroma.affymetric package has a way to correct for this uh, and sort of adjust the intensities that are achieved um, to account for the, the notion of allelic crosstalks. So then there are other uh, artifacts that um, actually are uh, really ubiquitous across any kind of measurements in the genome. Is uh, We know that there are, there are non-uniform properties of the genome such that they're GC-rich regions or AT-rich regions, and these perform quite differently uh, across the whole genome it, with respect to the, the probes. And so one needs to adjust for that. So a signal that one could obtain may simply be just due to the fact that the, the region that's being probed is highly GC-rich, for example. So the hybridization properties of GC-rich regions is different than AT-rich regions, et cetera. Um, hopefully that, uh, that makes sense. And then the fragment length uh, to, to do the digestion also has some, uh, some properties as well. And so without going into the, you know, the really nitty-gritty details here, um, this package essentially accounts for these, tries to account for these different properties and adjusts the data to make um, all the probes comparable to each other. And so you can imagine that if you were to do uh, several arrays, um, one might look at the profile of each one of the, the probes, and this is just a density plot or a, a histo smooth histogram of, of the intensities that come out. And, and you can see that they don't all um, line up. It's not completely reproducible. And so to make these arrays comparable to each other, uh, there's normalization um, that can then uh, uh, make all the experiments relatively comparable to each other after, after normalization. So we do normalization. And once we have normalization, then we can start to look at the genomic features that we're interested in. And, um, and so these consist of total copy number and loss of heterozygosity and allele-specific copy number, as we talked about. So, so just by way of notation, uh, you know, this isn't, um, you don't need to, to take away this, but, but I might refer to some of these terms. So, so we can have um, Y sub J A, which is the intensity uh, for the allele A at position J. Okay, and so this, this position J would be one of the uh, either 900,000 or 1.8 million probes um, on the array. Okay. And then uh, similarly for allele B. And then the total intensity at that position is just the sum of those, those two intensities. Okay? So you have the intensity for the, the, uh, pre the maternal allele, let's call it, and the paternal allele. And then to get the total intensity, we just sum the two. And then we have uh, the total copy number at that position is, uh, is that quantity. Um, that's essentially divided by uh, what we might expect from the reference, so the same quantity of the reference. And this can be, again, the match normal, or it can be a pooled reference. Um, and, and then the B allele fraction is, uh, is that um, B allele quantity over the total. Okay? So that just represents. Um, and so you can imagine if one is homozygous for, uh, for the reference, um, uh, then, then this will be uh, this will be zero, and if it's homozygous for the B allele, then this will be um, this will be one. So all of the signal will come from this. Okay. So how do we go from the signal processing step um, to actually inferring copy number? So, so here's an example of a tumor normal pair. So this is a match normal 
and uh, that's shown on the bottom here, and this is total copy number that's being shown. So uh, this is the sum of the two alleles, and, and then uh, up top here is the tumor, and so red represents uh, an amplification that's been, um, uh, that's been segmented. Uh, and green represents deletions. And so, <clears throat> so how do we, you know, get from, uh, you can imagine that when the data comes out, of course, they don't have these nice color coding associated with it. Um, they're just all black dots. And, uh, and we use some sort of algorithm to uh, map these dots to these nice discrete biological categories. And what you can see when we do that is that we can identify these very nice uh, events here. Uh, that suggests that this, this is material in the genome, in the tumor genome, that has been amplified relative to the normal. So the normal shows no sign of these events, uh, but they, these are events that are specific to the tumor, and so uh, these are the areas of interest that we want to zoom in on. Uh, what's shown here is an event that's actually shared between the tumor and the normal. And this is the real advantage of doing match normal uh, experiments, is that we were to look at this in isolation, we might say, oh, look, at this, look at this event here. This, is, um, this is, looks like a, a, a focal homozygous deletion. Um, this has been, this, this, this gene, the gene in here is completely inactivated, and therefore that must be related to cancer progression. So I'm going to go study, I'm going to make a, a functional knockout, and I'm going to put it into a mouse, and I'm going to study its biology, and, and I'm going to you know, spend um, five years of a postdoc's life um, studying this. But then if you looked at the match normal, you see, uh, okay, wait a minute. Um, there's also uh, a polymorphism in the normal. And so this would be one that um, you would probably not want to continue on for uh, the purposes of, of pathogenesis in cancer because um, it exists in the match normal. Yes? Are there any uh, well-known examples of events like that being linked to propensity to develop cancer? Oh, sure. Uh, absolutely. So uh, there are... Um, the BRCA gene, for example, is, is one where you have frame shifting deletions um, and uh, gained uh, widespread prominence with um, movie stars um, getting double mastectomies based on, um, uh, on the presence of, uh, of, of a genetic abnormality in, in those genes. Um, and, uh, and so the, uh, without a doubt, there will be um, the single nucleotide type of events are much better characterized. Um, than the copy number events, but now there's, um, you know, with, with whole genome sequencing becoming um, relatively cheap, and uh, even the, during these arrays, there are large-scale population studies that are looking for a hereditary basis of, of, of these events in cancer. Now, that really requires large-scale population-level studies to, um, to really hone in because, um, because the statistics um, where you have, it's a curse of dimensionality problem, where you're looking at many, many loci, you need um, uh, many, many patients to actually be able to hone in on a, on a statistical signal that may um, associate. So, but there's certainly, um, uh, it's a high a area of, of high activity, yeah. So the normalization process you were talking about before, uh, obviously, these are still showing up. So that normalization was done in terms of not the match normal. That's right. In this, in this case, yeah. So, so that's right. So, um, so in this case, uh, this these would have been done to uh, a pooled reference, um, okay. a standard reference. Yeah. And and so they would take the the tumor to the standard reference and normal to the standard reference right. and then do some sort of subtractive analysis. It's much better, however, in this case, I agree that it would have been to, to nor just normalize the tumor to the normal. Mm -hmm. and, and that, and, and that would have hopefully eliminated that. Yes? So how about the case, uh, the tumor is catch avoided? Yeah. Uh, does that mean that the sequence or uh, do the sleep, uh, the amount of uh, DNA we use is the same, right? Mm -hmm. And then the baseline to zero, is matched to the yeah. So this is an excellent question, and, and there are um, uh, tools that um, can can account for that, and uh, and so basically that's where looking at the actual alleles uh, really makes a difference, and uh, and so total copy number maybe one can couldn't tell um, 
if, if there's tetraploidy going on. But when, you, when one examines the alleles, then uh, that pattern starts to develop, and, and one can look at that and, and actually infer that. And so one of the tools that I've listed, um, particularly the OncoSNP, um, is, is a tool that can account for ploidy. That's true. Yeah. Yes? Uh, you sort of touched on this, but a lot of times I find I don't have smashed mm -hmm. Um And so um, what I've done in the past, and I don't know if this is OK, is I've downloaded, let's say, SNP uh, six arrays from the hat map or yeah. eight metric, but like, kind of use that as a pool of yeah. models. Yeah. Um, but I think you also mentioned, do you just make a dummy kind of file and put everything, set everything to two, or is it better to use the pool? It's, it's definitely better to use the pool because um, the pool normal will actually have um, the just a platform specific yeah. variation encoded in it, and and so it's much better to do that than, than to use a dummy reference. Yeah. But it, the you wouldn't want to sequence a tumor without a mash normal, so don't do that. That's like burning money. It's an uninterpretable data. Okay. So I should mention that 1,500 of the 2,000 breast tumors um, that we did in that um, study that we published last year we did did not have match normals, but we were still so we we're still able to pull out somatic genetics out of that. Um, but that's looking at large segments that um, you know at, at, a, at a resolution of a few few a few hundred KB, and that's very different prospect than single nucleotide analysis. Okay, so uh, so let's talk about allelic imbalance then. So uh, so here we have um, again just illustrating this concept. So. So here you have the total copy numbers illustrated here, and this is from uh, this is from a, a paper from Terry Speed's group, and uh, and so the total copy numbers centered around two, and you have uh, this little amplification event here, and so again what you can see is that so here's a profile of a region of the genome that's essentially unaffected. So you have uh, essentially these three different classes. You have your homozygous um, polymorphisms that uh, essentially center around zero or one, depending on whether it's homozygous for the maternal or paternal allele uh, or the major minor allele. And, and then here we have a cloud of data that's centered around 0.5, and these represent the heterozygous loci in that person's uh, genome. So here's a neutral region that where you see it's completely unaffected. Again, here's another neutral region that uh, has this concept of copy number, uh, copy neutral loss of heterozygosity. And you see a, a, a sharp departure from this pattern over here, and uh, we end up with uh, this pattern here. So this suggests that this is one of those events where you had a deletion followed by a duplication. And what's left over is uh, are the, the homozygous uh, Low side. So, so can can anybody try to estimate um, or, or or guess why why is why is it that we have th these bands that are sort of close to the to the edge but not quite at the edge? I mean, if if they're truly homozygous, we should see the data clouds should just line up right on top of each other. So, what's what's happening here? Normal tissue. Sorry. Normal tissue. Right. So normal tissue. So. So that, that's um, what's mixed in with this is there's still some residual cells or um, some number of cells that do exhibit heterozygosity. And so remember that this is an average signal across the whole mixture. And so the, tu the loss of heterozygosity in the tumor cells um, shifts the data, but, um, but 
what's holding this back from being completely to the extremes of the distribution uh, are the presence of, of normal cells that we're still measuring there. So that contributes to the signal that we see. So you could deconvolve this into the normal component, which would look like this, and the tumor component, which would look completely to the, to the edge. Okay. So we have an aggregate signal. And, that's, uh, and this is actually used. Um, we can use this to our advantage to try to estimate the amount of normal contamination that might exist in our, in our sample. So it, you, one can actually um, deconvolve the signal into two components, uh, and one can estimate uh, the contribution of each component to the, to the underlying signal. And we do this uh, quite, quite frequently in analysis of this type of data. What's happening in that sort of intermediate region? This one here? Yeah. Yeah. So this is probably an allele-specific copy number change. Um, so here you have a copy number change, and, um, and there's a split. All right, so 15 minutes. A bit left. Okay, so I'm going to just go through this part fairly quickly. All right, so here's just a uh, a simple diagram of, of total copy number and we're just going to go through now how the underlying principles for how one would segment this data and um, and so here you have a deletion here you have an amplification the question is is how do we actually uh, infer these these regions and these features in the genome so there there have been a number of uh, review papers on this um, there and uh, and so I'm going to compare really walk you through two different approaches that have been um, widely used in the literature and, and some of this um, some some of this, these tools are fairly old and um, and and there there have been newer examples but the concepts are fairly similar and applied to the to, to the newer tools as well so uh, a, a very popular approach is a, a non-parametric approach um, called DNA copy and originally um, uh, developed by Adam Olshin uh, who at the time was at uh, Sloan Kettering uh, there's a nice bioconductor package for this uh, so, have you, have you worked a bioconductor yet in the workshop? No? Yes? No? I think you will be. Um, so, uh, so, so you can just download um, this in bioconductor and, uh, and, and it integrates well um, and works with, in R. Uh, and, and then there are hidden, mar uh, hidden Markov model approaches, which are parametric approaches um, to the data, and I'll walk you through that. Okay, so let's just look at this DNA copy, uh, DNA copy algorithm. And, uh, and the key ideas here is that what it does is it output, outputs change points in the data. And so it tries to find regions uh, across the genome where there's a sharp change um, in the profile. Okay, so here you have a cluster of data points that uh, is centered around this, this mean line here. And then you can see at this point there's a sharp transition, and, and so there's a, there's a change, an abrupt change, that signifies that there probably is a copy number change and a breakpoint that's happening at this uh, region. And the major um, concepts here is that uh, this algorithm tries to minimize the within segment variation and maximize the between segment variation. All right, and uh, what they introduce is this idea of circular binary segmentation. So how does that work? So it's a similar notation for what I was talking about before. And, um, and so the, the, the new notation here is just really to compute the mean of a segment from I to J. Okay, so from position I to J. And we can just look at that pictorially. Uh, we take the, all of the uh, ends the, the, the full chromosomes essentially splice it together into a circle. And then we look at the I and J that maximize this, this score. Okay, so we try to identify these regions in the genome um, that maximize some score. So what is that score? The score is essentially a trade-off uh, between uh, the, the within segment variation and the between segment variation. So, so again, it's trying to maximize these quantities where the 
the mean, the difference between this part of that circle and this part of that circle is maximum. And then, uh, and then so it tries to uh, insert these positions at those particular points. And so it's, a, it's an exhaustive search across all possible points that identifies breakpoints uh, that, again, the major concept is to maximize between segment variation and minimize within segment variation. Yeah, is that clear? Okay. Okay, and so, uh, and then one tries to um, uh, com compute this for all possible uh, breakpoints and then assess <coughs> statistically whether um, uh, this is uh, the likelihood of that particular um, event under permutation. And so what we end up is, uh, is we end up with uh, the first step is a segmentation that identifies change points, and then it's just done recursively uh, until uh, there's no more changes. So we take the new segment and we make a new circle out of the new segment and, and repeat the process. Uh, and so uh, the, oh, I'm sorry, this is really bad uh, resolution here, but essentially what this green line represents are, um, are the mean, means of the segments. And so here's a segment, here's a segment, here's a segment, et cetera. Uh, and so the, the issue here is that uh, this algorithm outputs segments. Um, it uh, can identify regions of change. Um, uh, but uh, these segments have an arbitrary number of levels. And so um, it still requires some sort of post-processing to interpret the results. And, uh, and, and this is really done um, typically by thresholding um, and sometimes something more sophisticated. So there's a nice tool called merge levels, which could take, for example, um, you see that there's a level here and there's a level here. So there's some sort of change point here. But this may just be due to noise. And so uh, the idea is that uh, one would have to post-process and maybe join these two uh, segments so that we don't over-segment the data and, and misinterpret uh, those results. And so, uh, so ultimately what we want out of this process is we want to take these black dots and we want to classify them into something that's biologically interpretable. So for example, what's my region? What are the regions of loss? What are the regions of gain? And what are the regions that are neutral? And so this really requires a whole other step um, after segmentation to, to make that classification. And these are some of the tools that have been used to, uh, to, do, to do that. So by contrast to this, um, so the advantage of this is that it really doesn't require any parameters. So, uh, so you can just run the algorithm, find the, um, the breakpoints, and then impose uh, almost a user-based um, uh, thresholding of the, of the post-processing to, to do the interpretation. Another approach, an alternative way, is to try to simultaneously segment and classify the data at the same time. And so, so what, is it, what do I mean by that? So, so here, um, the segmentation helps with the segment classification and vice versa. And, and so the classification is done at the probe level um, into a fixed number of states. And so the state space in the simplest uh, notion is basically a loss, neutral, and gain. Okay? And we can, but there can be uh, increasing number of states as well. So one could, for example, se separate losses into homozygous deletions and hemizygous deletions, or gains into um, multiple levels of gains, or to try to really classify these super high level events um, that, we, that we are probably most interested in. So, so how does this work? Um, so there are a number of, uh, uh, of methods. Oh, wait a minute. Seem to be missing some slides. Oh well, so that, that's okay. So the, the the way this works is essentially we have um, parametric distributions that um, that define the different classes. So let me just go back to let's go back to this. Okay. So the idea would be that we have uh, a distribution governing losses, a distribution governing gains, and a distribution governing neutrals. The idea is to assign uh, the likelihood that each point belongs to one of these distributions. And, uh, and then the model assumes that um, one should be, uh, just due to the nature of the data, that the biological segments are likely to span number, a large number of probes, okay, a large number of consecutive probes. And so the model assumes that one should be essentially the same class as your neighbor. So if you're a loss, uh, if your neighbor is a loss, then chances are the next one will be a loss. 
Well, there's some sort of transition, that matrix, okay, there's a probability that one can transition from one state to another. And so it's uh, using uh, an algorithm called expectation maximization. One estimates the parameters of the model and then does a segmentation. And then based on that segmentation, re-estimates the parameters of the model and, and that process just iterates back and forth. Um, and there's, there's a, a vast literature on hidden Markov models for copy number arrays. Um, I've pointed you to some of the papers. Um, but essentially, that's, that's the way it works. And so, so at the end of the day, in contrast to the DNA copy, um, which just produces the change points, one gets the change points and the classifications of, of the different segments. And so that has some advantages to it, um, but it can be restrictive in the sense that um, usually we operate on a fixed state space where we have to specify, for example, the number of states that um, we think are in the data. So for example, typically what we do is we might use a six state space where we have hemi uh, homozygous loss, hemizygous loss, neutral. Uh, so those are three, and then the three levels of amplification. Um, and that's, that's usually enough to, uh, to, to cover the, the space. But uh, in sequencing data, um, the, since the resolution is higher, um, sometimes one might even want to expand to, to 10 or 20 states or e estimate exact copy number, which is you know, difficult to do. Um, really collapsing down to six states is, um, is, is an approximation. And it does not estimate the true copy number, but can really uh, we found in practice can can identify the regions that are under homozygous change and those that are under um, super high level amplification, which are the, ultimately the most interpretable results that, that we want to get. Okay, so I apologize for some reason that some slides were deleted, but I can try to get those to you anyways. Um, okay, so like I said, there's been a rich literature. Um, Leveraging hidden Markov models for these uh, SNP arrays. Um, these are some of the, the tools, uh, and there have been more uh, since since uh, since this. And, and so there's a nice um, in this uh, paper that I've uh, I've already outlined to you. Um, there's a nice uh, table that compares the different uh, methods and um, and talks about the different approaches and, and compares them. So I urge you to uh, to look at that. Okay, so we're getting to um, 10.30s, coming up. Okay, so <laughs> I just wanted to uh, quickly go over some of the concepts that uh, we may be covering in the lab. So, so one nice way to visualize these, uh, these events, especially when looking at a population of tumors, um, is with IGV. And what, you know, so one can actually go into the TCGA uh, portal, for example. Have you covered TCGA? Does everyone know what I... Yeah? Okay. So, so you can just download the TCGA data that is segmented and um, for, for the different tumor types and, and just upload it into IGV. So just natively without any manipulation whatsoever. Let's say you're studying a gene of interest and you want to know um, in, in the population of, uh, uh, of TCGA tumors that have been studied, there might be 500 or, or close to 1,000, and you've got your, your gene of interest that you're, you want to study, you want to know how often is that uh, particular gene deleted in, in TCGA um, and endometrial cancer versus ovarian cancer, for example. And you can pull in these data sets and just look at it. So, um, so I think, are you going to cover this in the lab? Yeah, okay, so, so we're going to go over this. I won't spend too much time on it, just to, just to show you that. This is the, uh, this is the OB2 amplicon in, in, uh, in the Metabric um, breast cancer data set. And so red here means amplification. You can see that there's a very focal and localized um, uh, region where um, these are the tumors that exhibit HER2 amplification. And, and, and the, the key point here is that in a population level, one can essentially look at what's the, what's the overlapping region here of all these segments. Um, and that gives you some idea of, of what selection is actually operating on. And so, so one can really hone down on, on just where the interval between these two bars and say, aha. And so you know, it turns out there are maybe five genes in that region, and one of them, of course, is RP2. Um, and, and so here's what a what a homozygous deletion looks like, um, and, and here's just this very uh, focal deletion. I think this is from 13, this is probably RB1, and, um, and so here's RB1 here, it's homozygous deleted. Okay, and so just in the remaining couple of minutes here, we're going to talk about um, 
uh, analysis of, co of, N of next generation sequencing data, so whole genome sequencing data. So uh, a few things that we and others have noticed is that um, the GC bias is a real phenomenon in, in, in sequencing data as well. And so uh, different regions of the genome uh, will, uh, in the bridge amplification step, will, uh, will amplify differentially than the AT regions. And so that creates some, uh, some noise in the data. So, so here's, for example, if we were to just take bins, and we take 1KB bins, and we try to plot uh, the number of reads that align to a particular 1KB, 1KB bin. And we just, we just plot that uh, uh, across it. The genome. Um, this this concept is really uh, rooted in the fact that again, um, when sequencing uh, a mixture of cells and and uh, the the amount of fragments uh, of a particular region will be proportional to the quantity of DNA present in that region. So if there's an amplification. Um, there's a, the number of fragments uh, that we sequence uh, for that particular locus will be higher than if there's a deletion. Okay, makes sense. Um, and so, uh, so here's uh, what it looks like when, um, when just uh, correcting uh, GC content. So we start to see a, a much smoother um, uh, and, and easier to interpret profile. And then, uh, and then we also uh, correct for properties of the genome that allow reads to map there. So of course, most of the genome, more than 50%, is highly repetitive and has a low mappability. So, um, so that will also influence how many reads align to a particular part of the genome. So we can correct for that as well. And then once we do that, then we can really start to see where the biology exists uh, in this genome. If you were to just look at this, it would be um, almost, it's a highly uninterpretable. Once we actually do the normalization steps, um, we can uh, start to see the, the regions of interest that we want to focus in on. And so, so when we actually do this in practice, um, uh, this is what actually uh, a genome that's been sequenced uh, with, uh, with whole genome sequencing and subsequent processing of the data, this is what the copy number profile looks like. And so we can start to get really nice discrete blocks uh, where we can start to estimate where the change points are and where, um, where the actual biological events of interest are. So I mentioned that um, we can do loss of uh, uh, heterozygosity analysis. I'll just skip over this, um, skip over that. <clears throat> so some new concepts then that have been um, illuminated by whole genome sequencing, uh, one of which is, is chromothripsis. So, so what this is, is uh, this is a published, uh, paper published by uh, Peter Campbell and company uh, in Cell in, in 2011. And what they describe is this concept of a chromosome shattering uh, followed by non-homologous end joining. And, and this is actually visible in the data and becomes um, actually quite a measurable property um, in, uh, in, in whole genome sequencing. And so, so what this basically shows is that um, there's, been, there's been this um, uh, catastrophic event that has essentially blown the chromosome apart. And, and the repair mechanism has actually stitched it all back together, but it's all been shuffled around. And, uh, and so, and somehow, again, this, is, this event um, is selected for, the cells are viable, um, the, the, the evolution is selected for this event, and, and, and this clone still uh, expands and, and exists in the tumor. And so what these arcs represent, essentially, exchanges of information across the chromosome. So where you see an arc from one point to another, there's a read that spans uh, that breakpoint. Okay, so there's um, the part of the read aligns here and part of the read aligns over there. And, uh, and so this is uh, really an extreme example of a, uh, a, a, a genome that's been completely rearranged. Uh, it doesn't resemble anything like a normal cell, uh, but it started from a normal cell and, uh, and has been um, just completely obliterated. And so, uh, so what is the significance of this? This may be due to the fact that um, you, you may have uh, a compromised homologous recombination, for example, um, or uh, other DNA repair mechanisms that are, that are, com that are compromised. Um, and uh, the significance of this can be that um, in a nice paper published uh, on neuroblastoma, uh, they looked at uh, a cohort of uh, approximately 90 tumors and found that um, cases with genomes that look like this uh, where, again, so if you've seen these circles plots? Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, so this is just one chromosome where you have 
this many rearrangements happening on the chromosome. I don't know how many it is, but it's probably thousands. Um, uh, and um, so, so tumors that exhibited uh, this particular phenomenon had a much worse prognosis than, than tumors that didn't have that phenomenon. And, and the reason why this is important is that neuroblastoma is a, it's a childhood cancer that um, typically doesn't have very many somatic mutations in, in, the, in, the, in the point mutation space. Uh, and so when people started originally sequencing neuroblastomas, it looked like a barren mutational landscape. There was really nothing to, 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 to pin your hat on. There were no low-hanging fruits in the coding space. Uh, and then this group came along and did home, whole genome sequencing and found that, look, there's a subclass of tumors that have undergone these, these um, really dramatic changes in their, in their genome architecture. Um, and this is probably what's leading to the malignant phenotype in those tumors. Um, so some more advanced topics, uh, complex rearrangements. Um, uh, Andrew McPherson in my group has been working hard on this problem and, and looking at um, uh, events that involve uh, more than two regions of the genome. So we can think about translocations where we have exchange of information between two, two parts of the genome. Um, uh, he's published a nice paper that really profiles where you have uh, involvement of, of three or more regions of the genome that create viable transcripts. Um, so you have, you, typically our concept of fusion genes is that we fuse gene A with gene B, and that ends up with some sort of oncoprotein. This would be um, many different genes coming together to create a, 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 a chimeric transcript. Um, so, so this is something that is gaining prominence um, in terms of looking at genomes like this. Uh, they tend to create um, entirely new proteins uh, that, that wouldn't have existed before in nature, and they, those, those get selected for. Uh, and then finally, I just wanted to end uh, with, a, with this uh, concept of uh, intratumoral heterogeneity. So this is from a paper published by uh, Nick Nabin from Mike Wiggler's group uh, in 2011. And so what they did is they did uh, single cell sequencing of a population of, of cells from, um, from, from breast cancer. And they flow sorted the cells into discrete populations that were, that had been characterized by different cell surface markers. And then they sequenced the individual nuclei uh, and estimated copy number profiles from those individual nuclei. And, um, and, and so what they noticed is that there were, um, if one can actually relate the genetics of those cells uh, by a phylogenetic tree. And, and just by clustering, they <coughs> fell into really these three different discrete categories. And so uh, within a tumor, uh, the copy number architecture of the different cells um, is, is quite different in, in these particular tumors that they sequence. And so, so yeah. So are you saying that every cell is different? Yes. That's what this shows. Exactly what Chad says, and so, uh, but these are very subtle variations within these groupings. But there, are, there are these three very distinct groups that suggest um, uh, really kind of dramatic, uh, punctuated changes in the evolutionary history of this tumor to, to select for these three populations. Okay, so just to summarize this section, so the geno genome architecture is uh, yeah. Yeah. That's right. So that, that this population or this representation is, is about a 50 quarter quarter in the different types of subgroups? Like the left hand group would be half of them? That's right. And so there's, that's that general sort of population. Correct. So the structure would be that half the cells are this, belong okay. to this group. Um, maybe a, a, a you know, 25% belong to this group and another 25% belong to that group. No, this is all from one, one tumor. This is a population of cells from one tumor. That's the point, is that within the tumor, these populations are different. Yeah, and so typically what we do is we, we actually will, will measure the aggregate signal from all of these cells. And, uh, and so that is just something to bear in mind, okay? So, so we, you know, we showed in the Metabric sample how there can be vast differences across the population of individual tumors, um, but even within tumors, uh, there can be um, incredible stratification of the cells. And so there's a beautiful paper, actually, in, um, 
in PNAS from Simon Tavares group or just a couple of months ago. And, and what they showed is, in, so, so a, a few years ago, um, uh, Roel Verhack et al. Uh, published the, the subtypes of glioblastoma. So these are uh, brain cancers um, that have, uh, uh, can be stratified into four discrete classes uh, by expression profiling. Um, so beautiful paper, big advance in terms of um, understanding the, the difference in, um, in outcomes in these different, uh, in these different kids with, with brain cancers. And, um, and so, but what Simon's group did is they went in and into individual tumors and analyzed uh, specific fragments of the tumors within one patient. And they were able to, um, to identify uh, a subset of patients that had within one tumor examples of all four expression subtypes. Okay, so, so what, what that shows is that um, the, a single sample will likely not represent um, the, the spectrum of, of changes in, in the whole tumor, and that um, maybe what, what the, the subclassification across the population, the inter-patient classification, may actually be due to just the sampling error uh, that exists within, within the tumor. So, um, so something to bear in mind. Uh, okay, so, so I should probably wrap up because Michelle told me to be on time, so I'm going to be on time. Uh, even though I'm 10 minutes late. But uh, so the, the, what I hope I've convinced you of is that the genome architecture, um, and, and in particular in copy number space, is, is a fundamentally important aspect of studying a cancer genome. Um, any experiment that looks at mutations or expression in isolation um, without considering the copy number landscape is probably, is not, is an incomplete representation, without a doubt. The copy number alterations can change the gene dosage and therefore drive expression of oncogenes and tumor suppressors. So we saw this in, uh, in the Metabric example, both in cis and in trans, and, um, and those proteins that are affected by copy number alterations are, are often the ones that we want to ho hone in on uh, to understand uh, the properties of, of those tumor cells. So copy number alterations can be measured using array-based hybridization and, and increasingly uh, next-generation sequencing. Uh, and I think, uh, are you going to do both in the lab, Andy? Yeah, yeah. okay. So, we, so, so you're going to actually look at both arrays and, and sequencing data in the lab. Um, and, and eventually, it, it's, it's, it's been said and it's true that um, arrays will, 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 will basically become obsolete. Um, that's, that's absolutely true. I believe that. Um, however, in the present day, as I said, it's still an order of magnitude more expensive to, uh, to look at uh, a, a whole genome of a, a, the, the whole genome sequence of a tumor versus an array. And so if one is only interested in profiling the copy number architecture of a, of a, of a tumor, um, it's still much more cost effective to do that by array. And, and the technology's been um, proven and, and is reliable and, and works, and we have all the analytic machinery for it. Um, the whole genome sequencing is, is more expensive. It gives you much more information. Um, but as I said, if you, you want to take a restricted view of just the copy number um, architecture, um, or even a, a preview of a tumor before sending it to sequencing, uh, it's a very cost-effective way um, to look at it. Okay? And sometimes the results of that preview can inform your experimental design for the sequencing, <coughs> the expensive sequencing experiments. So you spend a little bit of money, look at what you're what the, what the monster that you're actually going to look at uh, with sequencing and, and design the experiment appropriately and go on. Uh, and so, so I hope again that the properties of the genome that um, are revealed through copy number, the profiling um, really can indicate in important phenotypic characteristics of cancers. And so it's, it's just an important thing to look at. So um, here in this, your slide deck is just a number of tools that I may have mentioned in passing, and, and, and then uh, there are a number of, uh, the, all the URLs are there, and so you can go and look them up um, uh, on your own time uh, and, and start to explore this, this landscape. And um, these are all tools that are available. You can download. Uh, there, there are not very many restrictions on these tools, and that's why part of the reason why they're there. And they all have papers associated with them, too. These are all published methods. Okay, so I'll just leave it there and take some questions. Yeah. I'll, I'll let you carry with questions. If you have questions for Sora, but before I introduce what's going to happen. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. It's kind of interesting about the intertumor heterogeneity of half past 100 plus like tumor cells. Mm -hmm. Do you think like if you like sequence another 100 like uh, breast tumor cells why not not a patient? And if you class them together, do you think some of those mm. like cells will kind of class in the same group? Like, um, so it's, it's possible, but I think one has to think of a tumor uh, as being um, an individual evolutionary process. So, uh, so, so the, you can think of that um, each, each cancer that exists in a patient population will have undergone its own distinct evolutionary path. And so uh, one might see through the concept of convergent evolution that there will be certain properties that are in common. Okay, so the microenvironment of the of the the loca location of the tumor, for example, may select for certain features. So maybe p53 loss gets highly selected for in uh, in breast cancer, for example. Okay, um, or uh, and so so those types of commonalities are certainly there, and we also see um, even across different cancer types, you'll see commonalities. But at the end of the day, so to look at the whole genotype, um, then there will never be two cancers that are identical. Uh, yeah. Can you comment on the idea of uh, uh, the GC corruption? So mm -hmm. How do you do the GC corruption? Oh, uh, for for whole genome sequencing or okay. for yeah? Okay, so I glossed over that, and uh, so essentially what we can do is we can fit <coughs> a distribution. We say. Okay, so um, so we can look at uh, the properties of, of this GC bias, and we can so so we can take the read count um, uh, as a function of GC content, and you can see that essentially it's not um, it's not uniformly distributed, right? So um, there's some pattern associated with that. So we can fit a model to this, and essentially uh, adjust the um, the data points based on that model, and and end up with a with a profile that looks like this, which would be much more what we'd expect. Is that universally applicable? It is. Once yeah. you've done, once you just have to draw that. Yeah, and so there are, there are tools. So the HMM copy tool that um, that I've put in the slides um, essentially uh, implements this method, and there are other tools in Bioconductor and others that 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 um, have have taken this concept and, and implemented it. Yeah, but so this is where um, you know a bit. A lot of this data is, is high dimensional data. It's very noisy, uh, and so it, it, you know, advanced statistical consideration is actually really quite important. Um, it tends to get glossed over, um, but it's it's a fundamental um, uh, step in extracting the again maximizing the biological output of these very expensive data sets. Uh, one has to treat the data very carefully and and understand its biases and its warts. And um, there isn't this concept where um, it, it, you know, sequencing a tumor uh, is not going to just automatically give you all the biology that you need. Um, it, it, there's a significant amount of analytical processing that needs to take place. Um, and, and after that process, um, it's probably uh, quite an incomplete picture still. So.